Hey everyone, we'd like to welcome you to this version of Tournament Talk with Blues to Travel. We have a great guest today, uh, William Knox. We're going to be going through a little bit on, um, you know, just the state of the industry regarding facilities and destination management. And there's no one better that I could think of to have join us than, than William. And we're going to talk a little bit about his his new endeavor within the sports ETA world. So um, welcome, William. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, so just some background on myself. My name is Jason Puckett. I've been in the industry for quite some time, both on the uh, DMO side and also with facilities. Uh, and now currently uh, Director of Business Development for Pellucid Travel. So I'll run through William's background here. Uh, William earned his bachelor's degree in sports marketing um, and with a minor in business from Indiana University. He then went on to work for the Bloomington Convention and Visitors Bureau uh, and was also the director of the Hoosier Sports Corporation. He then moved to Hamilton County uh, to become the director of sports development there uh, and served as the director for uh, their sports authority as well. Then recently was the director of the Grand Sports Campus, where they built a 400 on a 400 acre campus, built a 370,000 square foot facility, which is amazing, and is now the president owner of Legacy Sports Group, as well as a partner uh, of the collective. So quite a background there, William, for you. Yeah. No, it's been a fun journey. You, you, you take me back to my early Bloomington days. That's where, you know, I, I would say I cut my teeth. I had great leadership back in those days, and it was fun to kind of start there. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, I mean, so what was your uh, what was your original plan for your career when you were in college? Yeah. You know, I knew I wanted to do something in sports. Really, originally, I wanted to be in the hotel industry. I, You know, my family traveled a lot when we were young and I got to go out and see some amazing places um, as I grew up. And every time we check into the hotel, I'd always see these hotel GMs in suits. And I was like, I want to be one of those guys one day. <laughs> so, you know, kind of fast forward to, you know, going to IU, kind of starting in that space, was thinking about business school and was like, yeah, that's hard. That's really hard. Uh, I, I'd love to do it, but let me see if there's another path for me. Um, and, I, and I found tourism. And uh, ever since then, it's been my singular focus. Um, during my junior year, I started to get really involved on the sports side of tourism um, and fortunately for me, my senior year got an opportunity to do an internship with Hamilton County, I'm sorry, uh, Monroe County Convention and Visitors Bureau that transitioned into my first job. Yeah, that's awesome. So it, it's always great, especially for young folks in the industry to get into an internship and see what it's really about to make sure that that's what they wanted to do. So what, what elements of tourism, once you got into it and you're really kind of understanding what it meant, did you, did you like that kind of helped you decide this was going to be your career path? Yeah, I, I just, it was, it was one of those, uh, you know, you take a few classes during your later years in college and it kind of cements your decision. And, you know, there were one or two courses that I took where I was actually able to be hands-on and work on some projects with a group of individuals that kind of really made me know that I was going down the right path. I, you know, I tell everybody this and nobody really believes me but I've been in this industry for over 20 years and I feel like I've only worked maybe 10 days in my life because I truly enjoy what I do. Um, but I, er, early on, I was really passionate about the sales side. I, I enjoyed getting out selling, you know, when I started off, um, I started in convention sales with Hamilton County, uh, with Monroe County. And back in those days, we didn't have fancy databases. We had resource books that we would take out and flip through and find the company we wanted to call on. I'd call them and say, hey, I'd like to talk to your sales guy. And the you know, receptionist would be like, oh, yeah, you want to leave a message? And I'd, keep, I'd make 30 or 40 of those calls a day. And that's what got me to kind of refine my skills related to kind of my, my, my people skills. Yeah. Uh, because at the at that point in time, you needed to get past what we call the gatekeeper and figure out how you can talk to the person who makes decisions. So I really enjoyed the sales side and, the, and that quickly grew to the development side. And that's where I kind of spent a lot of my time in Bloomington doing. OK, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I still love it when I see it when we're at conventions that someone has a binder with all the information. Printed out. <laughs> I love that old school. Program. At least, you know, they did their research. Right? Absolutely. So that's, that's always that's always awesome. Um, yeah. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about your career growth. So when you transitioned from Hamilton County to Grand Sports, um, you know, what were some of the lessons you learned? I mean, not necessarily just in facility, but just in industry water, just in general business, because that, that was a big change for you, I, I, I assume. Yeah, definitely. And fortunately for me, I've got it more um, um, fairly unique story. I was able to be on the DMO side when the concept was being developed. So I served on the mayor's 
commission that he put together to really flush out the scope. So I co-chaired uh, that group with an individual and we really flushed it out, got to the point where um, we started construction and then I was able to sell the park um, on the DMO side for several years before transitioning to the campus manager or director of the campus position. So I had a very unique perspective given that I was a part of the development team on the very front end. I was able to sell the park from the DMO side and then I came on board to help manage the park day to day. So that that helped me transition into the role here at Grand, well, the role there at Grand Park um, a lot easier, kind of having all that historical knowledge. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's a 360 approach, especially when you have to sell something, but also help develop it. You really had a real, you know, uh, intimate knowledge of what that facility could and could not do. Yeah. So when you were in that development phase, what were the other key stakeholders in that, that planning process? Yeah, and it, early on, it was a, a, a small group of individuals that came together to really understand if the project was feasible not really bringing in stakeholders at that level, just really fleshing out the performa, trying to understand what the, the, the options were for location here in the community. So a lot of groundwork done in that space. Once we got through the, the, the kind of the early development stage where it's like, okay, we, we can find the land. We think we can afford to purchase it. We've kind of flushed out a, a, a high level uh, five-year um Performa, it looks like it'll pencil provided these different things come together. Then we started to look at the programming aspect, and that's where we brought in first our local uh, community, uh, sports community, because we knew that this facility would benefit them as well. Even though it was designed and developed for tourism, we knew that the local piece was, was big for us. So we want to bring in our local sports organizations, get an understanding of what they needed, how their programs operated, what we could bring over um, and kind of went through that. Then we, you know, we went out and looked at some of the larger groups, you know, tried to identify some of our key stakeholders that would come in and manage the bulk of the operation. Sure. So what, um, what mix of local use and tourism use would you say the park has? Yeah, we're, we're probably 80% tourism, right? 20% local. And, um, we have one of the largest clubs in Indiana that calls Grand Park home. Um, their travel teams all practice and play most of their games at Grand Park. They also have a rec league that they they uh, produce here as well. And then our lo local rec programming organization, they do a lot of their events here uh, during the week. But, you know, Friday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, on most nights, even during the school year, are more travel-related programs here on campus. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that was the purpose of why it was built, but you're still getting the community to be able to utilize the facility and, and you know, take some some ownership and, and claim of it in their community, which is which is great. Um, so what do you think at, at, at so far? I know I know it's pretty early on, but kind of what's been your biggest achievement, would you say? And then on the on the other side, your biggest challenge with with when you're with, with Grand Sports Park? Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot. We have several stakeholders that have been with us since the day we opened the park. Um, a lot of those arrangements were key to, to making sure we got off the ground um, in, a, in a big way related to kind of getting the schedule field and all that good stuff. So, you know, when you have that many individuals to coordinate activity and things of that nature, sometimes that's a significant challenge if, if you're kind of not all on the same page. We've right. been very fortunate to have a really good group of individuals that we work with. And we've gotten to the point now where we're in a rhythm. A lot of the events we have here are annual events. So we've kind of got an understanding of how the calendar flows and, you know, where our gaps are and how we can drop events in. And, and we're starting to get a little creative in that space as well, where we're starting to, to really understand the calendar. And if there are significant gaps that are annual, we're, we're starting to create content to drop in there as opposed to trying to always find something to fill those gaps. So that, that would have been one of the biggest challenges early on. And, and then one of the biggest, you know, positives in my um, time here was, was getting the Indianapolis Colts to transition their training camp to our facility. Mm -hmm. So that happened in 2018. It's been a great partnership. We're hoping to continue that partnership long-term, but um, to, to have an NFL team call your facility home for six weeks is, is, is pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. Now, I know the pandemic might have changed some things, but I could imagine having the attendance of the fans 
that must have been a little bit of a challenge to work that out, right? Yeah, it, it was. We actually shut our doors completely for about a six week period. Um, okay. And then we were able to reopen um, under these new guidelines, obviously. Um, but we were very fortunate. Uh, we worked with the state um, as they were looking to develop their updated protocols and plans and, and were able to inform them of kind of how our facility operated such that we can alter a few things that, you know, all of their new plans initially went into effect 8 a.m. Or, or 12 p.m. Saturday night. Well, as you know, there's a tournament going on. You can't flip a switch that night in the middle of a tournament. Right. And we've got right. protocols changing. So we're able to work with them to get some of those things changed over. Um, so it, it, it was a positive for us. We actually had, you know, ironically had one of our best years in 2020 as a result of being able to get back open. Some of our neighboring states weren't as fortunate and we picked up some business from some of those locations. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's a testament of it. You've heard it a few times over my career, and it's really played itself out in, in, in three major world events, uh, you know, that sports is really recession proof to a certain extent, you know, with the housing crisis and then the stock market collapse back in 08 and 2010 and now the pandemic. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, that's, that's great. And the fact that your county and the location diversified their assets to be able to sustain themselves and generate revenue is a great thing. Um, yeah. And, and to your point, I, I've always I've witnessed during my time here, just like you, that there's there, there has to be a very significant event for um, parents not to take their kids on their travel events. Yeah. Um, I was not, I was a little concerned about the pandemic, different set of circumstances. And I was like, how is this going to affect us long term? And while it, it did take a toll and we're still understanding what it means for us long term, I can I can safely say that you know the pandemic uh, caused significant issues, but as a result, we've been able to retool and figure out a new path forward. And and again, we we had another great year this past year. That's awesome. That's awesome. So what what do you so now shifting over to Legacy Sports Group? What is your day to day focus? What are you focused on right now as as you guys as, as a young uh, emerging you know entity? Well, uh, 28 days in working at it full time, it's chaos. Yes. But uh, it's been a it's been a blessing to have a good group of individuals around me to help me through it. Um, Legacy has been around for a number of years. I've just been kind of slowly working my way towards being able to work at full time. Okay. Uh, now that I am, it, it's it's just it's a blessing, like I said, to have a great group of individuals. We've immediately come out the gate with a few projects that we're working on in the facility space. We're working with a few other clients on some more some strategic planning efforts, but really we just want to be a resource for individuals who are looking to do something in the sports tourism space or the sports space in general. Right. Um, we 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 have also helped some smaller communities with their rec programming and and how to orchestrate and facilitate that. So. We, we look at ourselves as a resource for sports. And if we don't know it, we know somebody who does, um, given my partnership with, with the, guy, the guys in the collective. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we're, we're here to be a resource. So the three primary focuses for the company is consulting, events, and management. And under that management bucket is where we kind of live with our partnership with Grand Park. We manage certain aspects of the park uh, on behalf of the city. And so your goal will be to kind of add to that portfolio of management with other facilities. Yep. And you, does the company also help with uh, from idea to actually getting shovels in the ground for new facility construction? We do. And, and we're working th towards a partnership with a few other organizations related to that. But we, we have a robust set of tools that we've collected over the years to help a community understand, A, if they should build a facility and B, if they do, how they should go about it. Right. Yeah, that's so important. You just said that because, you know, that whole mantra from Field of Dreams, you build it and they will come. Yeah. You know, while that does hold true for a lot of destinations, I, I, I know personally of some destinations that I think probably have buyer's remorse. Yeah. In fact, they didn't really look at their competition set. They didn't look at what the community could support. And while they may have a bright, shiny new facility, they don't have the hotels or or, or vice versa that regard. And so um, that's great to hear that you, you spend the time to really look and evaluate that um, what the process. Let's say someone comes to you with an idea and they want to build a facility. How long is that process of the evaluation to when you're actually kind of moving forward to, to you know, making it a reality? Yeah, that great question. And, and obviously that varies depending on the community sure. and setup. 
Um, we've worked with a few private uh, companies that are looking to develop much faster, you know, can move a lot quicker than some of the public um, facilities that we've worked with. But, you know, it, it, the, the scope and scale of the project is, is obviously a large piece of that. And then if they've already got the ground under control, yeah. um, another big, big piece of that. So a, a lot of times what I fa- have found is communities can 100 percent afford to build a complex but they don't know what they want. And the, the key piece of it is the operation. That's where I think a lot of these facilities get hung up. You know, they can build it, they can design it. It could be the nicest thing out, but the operations and the model by which you use to operate it, whether it's operated by the, the, the owner mm-hmm. or you do a third party, um, or if you have a, in, 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 in the third party option, is there a local company, you know, group of individuals that already provide programming that you're looking to, or a, a, a sure thing outsource management provider that can come in and kind of look at it from a broader perspective? So, the, you know, all those things kind of come into play. But I would say when we do some of our initial evaluations, uh, we come in on the front end and we kind of have that entry level conversation and we provide all of our clients with a one sheeter and you know beyond that that's when we can start the engagement but that one sheeter gives you enough information based off of what you share with us on if you want to go at it on your own you know this is what you should look at if you want to engage us this is what we'll help you with and and that's kind of how we approach most projects yeah yeah and and the point you made there about you know the management, you know, financially, these facilities really need to be self-sustaining because while they may have an influx of, of financial support in the beginning, right through tourist development tax or whatever it may be, to keep that successful in the long term, um, that's that's it's a very yeah valid point about the management yeah. and how it's going to run and what the goals are, and that's always tough when you have a lot of stakeholders. You know, of my time with Sarasota County, we we got some facilities built and. You know, making sure that everyone has a voice, but at the end of the day, making sure that you have one singular mission focus on that facility is key. So, um, yeah. so you mentioned it before. You're also a member of the collective. Uh, that's a consulting agency, right? And sports tours in general. Some some really great um, folks on that group that have a long standing history in sports tourism. Can you share with me any sort of like initiatives you're working on right now, or projects that are that are able to be shared out in the public that you know, can give an example or give an idea of what you what you can do through the collective? Yeah, I, and I won't mention names yet, just because some <laughs> of these projects are kind of not, it, it's funny, I say I won't mention names, all of these are public projects, so you could find them somewhere. Right, but, but let's make people uh, hard for people, they got to figure it out on their own. Yeah, <laughs> no, we're working with a few groups that are looking to do some fairly significant um, sports facilities within their destination. Um, and, and, you know, given the day we're in with the ARPA funds and all this money that's out there in the market from the private side, as well as on the public side, um, a lot of people are noodling through these different opportunities. So we're working with a group in Florida on a a potential facility project. I've got four groups I'm working with here in the Midwest, you know, one of which is trying to do a 200 acre complex and another is trying to do a 40,000 square foot building. So, you know, they range in scale depending on what that community is, is able to, um, to to fill. But the collective, what we've done there um, is brought what I think is some of the be- best minds in sports tourism together to just that all have our own niches mm-hmm. within the industry. And we work as a group to try to help provide solutions to communities. So we've got guys who run events every day and can kind of go through an event strategy with you through individuals who have launched several sports commissions who can come in and kind of help you in that space. So we're not experts in individually, we're not experts in everything, but collectively we've been able to come together and pretty much tackle any sports related challenge that a community has. Yeah. I like how you work the name of the collective back in there. <laughs> yeah, I thought it's smart that everyone has their running lanes, you know, that they're experts in their one field and together you have the ability to, to, to support really, Kind of any initiative in the sports tourism industry that's that's great so um all right i want to switch over to this new sports eta so you're now the new role is to lead the facilities program development um can you kind of share what your goals are for the sports facility membership and, and programming that you may have around this yeah this is a really exciting concept that we've been working on for a number of years when al um, took the role as ceo this was a, as a desire of his to get something like this off the ground and We've been mining it for the last few years. As you know, we've had a few summits, but now it's time to really take it to the next level. So 
what we will do is come alongside of sports ETA and work towards fully fleshing out that concept and development such that it's another piece um, for sports ETA under their umbrella. Uh, not yet standalone conference, but we'll also, we'll always potentially for the near future paired with symposium, but we will also have some offshoots where we do very similar to the 4S summits. We'll do some other engagements for facility operators, managers, individuals who are looking to develop facilities to have some of those conversations in communities that already have some of those assets. So really cool opportunity here to kind of look at bringing in another level of individual that's related to our industry to have some of these conversations while we're already all together. Yeah. Yeah. It's so great to see that the growth of it too. You know, I think everyone assumed it Sports ETA is really destinations and event organizers, but there's this whole other piece to it that is that is really valuable and emerging, and it's it's great to have you leading that. Will you foresee it being a resource too for 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 young professionals just getting into the industry to kind of learn more about that sector and maybe change like you did, right, going from sales into facility development and management? Yeah, I think we will. You will start to see in the near future tracks related to venue, um, you know, kind of at the CEO level, the development side of things, but starting out on the entry level operations facility, you know, one on one types, um, because they're they're becoming a very integral part. They've always been an integral part of our our, our association and our industry. You know, you can't do a tournament without a venue. It's right. just now the, the the focus on those venues have changed significantly. So we're just wanting to make sure people understand kind of the new realities where you don't just go off and mow a cornfield anymore and put some lines and goals out. It's, it's a little more advanced than that. Right. I mean, the customer expectation is much higher now, especially yep. with facilities like, like Grand Park and, and those out there that they are, they are expecting a different level of service and just um, their experience in general. And so, um, you know, recently at the U.S. Sports Congress, there was a good panel about that. And it was it was eye opening to me the amount of technology effort and time that's put in to make sure that the customer coming in has a great experience, um, not just the event organizer, but his participants as well. So, yeah, um, yeah that's great. Um so what, what are some challenges in the short term and long term that you that you want to address, not only through this group, but in your in your current role that you see um, really more on the facility side? Yeah, I, I think we're still kind of in this 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 space of dealing with COVID. You know, right. while you know, in some communities, the you know, we're kind of trending down and others are still trending up and. Until we get this under wraps, there's still going to need to be protocols put in place. And I think. Um, the, the state, I'm sorry, not the state, the sport TTA will probably give some guidance for facilities related to some of those protocols. Um, it will not be any type of mandates, but we were able to do um, some things here in the state of Indiana that helped other communities kind of look at how they would reopen their facilities or keep their facilities open. So we may now try to take that to a national level as it relates to facilities. Every, it is very difficult, though, because every state has different levels of uh, yes. requirements. So, again, there'll be broad stroke you know, recommendations that then you'd have to figure out how to apply for your individual situation. But that, that's one of the challenges I think we'll still look at in the short term. And then long term, I think we just want to make sure that all of our venues have access to all of the, to your point, the technology and the enhancements, because you know, we look at what we've done here at Grand Park and uh, we're in our eighth season and, you know, the facility will continue to be great. And we're going to try to continue to invest in it to get the latest and greatest. But that service aspect, that customer service, that visitor experience is key. And, you know, when we do that well, you know, it, it, it raises the boat for our industry as a whole. So we want to make sure we put everybody in a situation where they can utilize their natural assets on their facility within their facility to make sure they provide the best possible experience for their guests. Yeah. You're raising that, that minimum expectation of service by doing that. And it, you know, rising tide lifts all boats, you know, by doing that, it's going to, it's going to spread across the country. So that kind of fits into my next question, kind of what elements of a facility, right. Were, were nice to have five to 10 years ago that are now they're, they, they're must haves. What are some yeah. things that maybe you think that are now, th th it, it is the standard now? 
Uh, two things come to mind immediately. One is Wi-Fi. The yeah. other is streaming services. Um, those two are are what we call like a utility now. It's like water. You, you got to have water on site and you, you got to have those two things. So if you can't put them in initially uh, because of cost, I would definitely put the infrastructure in such that it makes it very easy to do it in the future. So those are some of the things. So we, we opened our doors in 13 um, and you know, we, I could go through a half dozen things right now that we probably need to change as a result of kind of how facilities are being developed current day. Right. Yeah. The Wi-Fi is just an expectation. I, I think my kids would lose their mind if they didn't have access to Wi-Fi going to watch, going to watch an event. Um, and it, and the Wi-Fi too allows for some really uh, eye-opening things in regards to just data of the customers right who they are where they're from how they're traveling to and from events which is really a valuable tool uh and then you know getting back to the streaming aspect you know grandma and grandpa may not be be able to travel but they want to watch and, and it's probably an opportunity for some some revenue generation from the facility as well um, depending yeah. on what, what system or platform they use so no i agree and and the, the next big one for us um, which a lot of facilities i think are already looking at is mobile ordering um, parents, particularly for the sports where there's not a huge stop in the game, parents don't want to spend 30 minutes in the concessions line. So <laughs> we're trying to figure that out. Uh, for smaller campuses, this is a little easier when you're looking at a 400 acre footprint. It becomes a little more challenging, but that's the next thing, you know, being able to come in and actually take in the game and not have to go and stand in line and get a, a bag of popcorn. Hey, at 400 acres, you might need to do a partnership with like Uber or, uh, yeah. or something and have them deliver from concession stand to field. Uh, yeah. If you're ever doing that, I want I want credit for that. Okay, I got I got it. This is on, <laughs> this is on recording, so I got I got to credit you with that. Uh, so what what advice would you give to you know young professionals kind of entering the industry? One from a general tourism perspective, but but you know someone that's going to go into the facility management or operation standpoint. Yeah, I would say just given what I've experienced here the last few years, if you've not done an internship while you're in high school, you're already behind because we're, we're starting to see more and more kids at the high school level coming in doing internships with us um, related to them trying to figure out where they want to go in the space. They know they want to be in sports, right? trying to figure out early on so that when they do get to college, they can kind of focus in and, and look at those internship opportunities. If you're waiting until your senior year in college to do an internship, you're still behind. You're even more behind. Yes. So there, there's that level of expectation now where you're a volunteer. You know, when you don't have a job, that volunteer experience and those other things you've done is your resume. So you need to build those early and make them consistent. If you've got a church group you've worked with, you know, continue to do that on a consistent basis as long as you can. If you, you know, volunteer for an event, Try to stay with that and grow in your levels within those volunteer opportunities. Um, sometimes those are more valuable than a job at McDonald's, you know, when you're looking at, you know, trying to get a job once you come out. But I would say, you know, the, the, the facility space is exciting. You know, there, there are a lot of roles and responsibilities that are kind of more hands-on, labor intensive. But then there's also, once you kind of get to the point where you've got some experience, um, marketing, business development, sponsorship. I mean, there, you know, you look at every other industry and, and those verticals, you, you, you could replicate those within a venue. Yeah, that's great advice. Because I think a lot of folks out there, they love sports, they love to play them, they love to watch them. But working in the industry is completely different. Uh, you know, I, I always wanted to work in, in baseball and I cut my teeth early on in my career and realized I didn't want to work in baseball. <laughs> you know, I wanted to enjoy it. And um, it's the same thing. Being able to get that exposure to tourism was, was how I ended up in the industry myself. So uh, very good advice. Um, yeah, just, I'll, I'll wrap it up on this. Is there any sort of projects or initiatives that you're working on, you know, that we should be on the lookout for? I mean, obviously, what you're going to be doing with facilities program development of the sports ETA is great, but is anything else we should keep an eye on? Yeah, we're working with Grand Park on a new concept that we're going to roll out here in the next couple months. Um, it's more related to uh, football and a, and a few other sports that we're going to kind of really approach in a major way here with the campus. So uh, I'll definitely get with you to get back on here to talk to you a little bit about that when it comes out. But we're excited about that opportunity to continue to grow certain sports here on on this footprint yeah 
Well, thank you, William. I appreciate your time for coming on here on Tournament Talk, and I hope that the folks watching this get some value. I did. I learned some things on here, and uh, I look forward as to seeing you at some some future conferences and uh, just appreciate you coming on. No problem. Uh, anytime I can help you, let me know. All right, right, will do.